Hello, my name is Patricia, and this is the Poetry P podcast. Welcome. We're more or less at the beginning of the seventh series, and knowing what's coming, I'm really quite excited. Together, you and I are going to explore many concepts of our chosen poetry form. We'll learn together and write poetry together, and I hope we'll have some meaty discussions around where we see our genre going in the future. Oh yes, I'm looking forward to it. Now, last time on the podcast, I read the poems that I nominated for the various awards for 2023. I hope you enjoyed them. And of course, I'm going to be nominating again this year. So make sure you send me your submissions. The website has our submission diary for the year. If you're not listening in real time, go over there and check it out. There's nearly always something you can submit to. This month, January 2024, we're working on haiku and senryu using illusion. And later in the month, split sequences. All the chosen submissions will be in our PDF journals. There will be six this year. Oh, by the way, did I mention that Journal 223, the last one of last year, is out now? It truly was a bumper issue with so many interesting pieces of work from haiku and senryu, renku, haibun, and split sequences. So if you don't have it already, there will be a link in the show notes. You can go and check it out. This year, I want to issue some poetry in print form. I told you it's going to be an exciting year. At the moment, I've got two things in mind, a print anthology, But only those poets on the mailing list will be invited to partake in that. So you know what you need to do, don't you? And the second thing is a Poetry P Awards volume. This will be the poems, haibun, split sequences that I regard as truly outstanding from our submissions this year. There'll be more info as we go along the year. But like I said, you know what you have to do. Head over to the mailing list. If you're not already on it, do sign up. Everything's on the website. And I hope it's all very clear. If it's not, just email me and I'll sort it out for you. Now, there's one last thing I want to tell you about before we head over to the main event for this podcast. This year, Poetry P has a membership scheme. The link will be on the show notes, but I've created it on our Buy Me A Coffee page. You'll find certain ways to support Poetry P and all the work I do. And in return, there will be some benefits for you too. I hope you'll be able to sign up and help me keep Poetry P alive and creating content for you to enjoy. Of course, the podcast will always be free and you can make donations as and when to keep us going too. It's really up to you. But if you can help with a membership or a donation, I would be truly grateful. Well, now that's a lot for you to do. Check out the submission diary, submit to submissions, make sure you're signed up to the mailing list and have a look at our membership scheme. Let me know what you think. Today, you're going to hear from one of the sages of the haiku world, George Swede. He's going to kick off our discussions on the form our poetry takes. And just so you know, there will be a video version of this reading available on Poetry P's YouTube. Do you ever wonder about the essence of the work we produce? About what makes haiku a haiku? What is the difference between haiku and senryu? And what is it that differentiates the haiku and senryu from a short poem. Well, if you've been listening to me at all, you'll know I do. And today with George, we're going to explore those issues while enjoying a reading from one of the preeminent poets of our genre. If you were listening last time to hear the poems and poets that I chose to nominate for the various awards, you'll have heard how thrilled I am to be talking to George. 
I think I managed to keep my hero worship under control, and together we've created something for you to enjoy. Do let us know. We would both love to know what your thoughts are on what we're talking about. Do you agree with us? Do you agree with George or me? Feedback would be very much appreciated. Let me know. So let's visit with George and hear him read from his book, The Way a Poem Emerges. Honestly, it's a fabulous book, one that really got my brain cells working. And of course, there'll be a link in the show notes. But here he is. George Swede, welcome to P Towers, and thank you so much for visiting with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Lovely to have you. And ostensibly, you've come along to read to us from your book, The Way a Poem Emerges, A Haiku Trinity and Beyond, which I have to say, George, was not just a terrific read, inspiring as well, but as I think I told you, it got my mind racing, and we're going to go into that as we go along. But before we get to your book, I have a few poems which are not in it that I'd love to hear you read. And I'm hoping you're going to indulge me and say yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. So in 2024, sorry, Poetry P will be delving into Tanka. And I wondered if you'd start us off with one of your Tanka and then maybe a couple of haiku to follow. Okay. Well, uh, the first one, well, the only talk I'll read is about my brother's uh, suicide. I reread my brother's suicide note. Tomatoes ripen on the sill. I reread my brother's suicide note. Tomatoes ripen on the sill. Unhappy wife, I pedal my bike through puddles. Unhappy wife, I pedal my bike through puddles. Fresh snow, his shadow parodies an old man walking. Fresh snow, his shadow parodies an old man walking. And the latter I can speak to as being the absolute truth. Watch my shadow. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what's happening. Uh, George, I'm sort of getting there myself, so I can I can understand that totally. But uh, the second one, second piece you read, The Unhappy Wife, I think it could also have been written by my husband because when I'm a great cyclist, I, love, I go out every day on my bike. And one of the pure pleasures in life is absolutely pedaling my bike through puddles. L absolutely love it. So uh, that, that was that really spoke to me. I think perhaps the first one was very interesting as well. It's, as you said, about your brother's, your stepbrother's suicide. And I did wonder, having or probably still going through the grieving process myself, did it help you with your grieving process to write about your stepbrother's suicide? Oh, yes, it did. And poetry, writing of any kind, is uh, therapeutic. As a matter of fact, back in the 70s and 80s, I was quite involved with uh, poetry therapy, poetry as therapy, attending workshops, uh, going to conferences, and also uh, uh, publishing a few articles on, on the process. Yeah, I highly, highly recommend it uh, as a type of um, therapy, especially the haiku can be quite liberating because it's it's not asking too much of someone, but just to sort of focus on the moment, which is often very important. Because when we're upset, we sometimes forget where we are, we're, we're sitting in a room or we're walking and just focusing on where you are, takes your mind away from your troubles, gives you a, piece, a bit of peace, gets the biochemistry back to normal. But then again, this is done by many other things like riding a bicycle. <laughs> and also gardening. <laughs> it's not the only way. This is true, both of which uh, I love to do. I was out in the garden this morning. I daren't show you my nails because they're still, despite trying to clean them, they are absolutely filthy. But, you know, it's a good filthy. 
that's true. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. Uh, now we're going to hear some of the poems you've chosen to illustrate, to include in your book, The Way a Poem Emerges, A Haiku Trinity and Beyond. But before I ask you to read, I have my first question of the day for you. You've got such a body of work. How on earth did you choose the work for the book? Well, I uh, went back to find uh, poems that had not appeared yet in uh, any collection. So I found a few early poems that seemed to me to be uh, appropriate. And then uh, also some recent poems that had not appeared in any collections. Combined them and there you are. It was, seems to work. Certainly does work. Uh, can we have a, a look at the title and dissect it a bit? You've called it The Way a Poem Emerges, A Haiku Trinity and Beyond. And you say in the foreword to the book, what practitioner of Japanese short form poetry has not engaged in a discussion about whether a poem is haiku or senryu and then come away no wiser? And you go on to say, out of frustration, I began to explore the possibility of new definitions, ones that only used objective criteria. Now, uh, anyone who listens to the podcast knows that I spend a lot of my time thinking about the essence of haiku, what it's all about. So I was I was absolutely thrilled to read this in your book. And I'd really love you to tell us a bit about your thoughts on the haiku trinity. And I'm wondering, does, the, does this thought process stem from an essay you wrote in Modern Haiku in 1992, Hybrids of Nature and Human Content? It, it certainly does. And... Um... And then after publishing it, um, it lay dormant for a while, and um, there was some response to it, of course, mm -hmm. and mainly uh, perplexion and uh, confusion. And what happened uh, subsequently over the couple of decades is that um, my feelings about it grew stronger as I realized that there was this continuing negativity about the senryu as somehow being an inferior form. Okay. And uh, I thought, well, you know, it's just simply another form of haiku with a different uh, context. And um, so that's what got me going. Uh, it was something that came from inside. It was sort of, I was driven by some person inside me that was, was uh, directing traffic. And um, so um, that's how the book emerged. I wanted to get my point of view out, mm -hmm. knowing full well that it was probably going to be uh, it was not going to be accepted by many people, because the senryu is so deeply rooted as a senryu and as having a certain definition mm -hmm. that involves uh, humor and satire. Yeah, and the uh, haiku is, is seen as something else that's uh, more serious and very imagistic. Mm -hmm. And um, I take uh, exception to these points of view. Um, to me, senryu can be very imagistic also. And haiku can also be humorous. So let me just give you one example um, of, of that is the um, uh, one involving a crab. A crab scuttles into a tidal pool. Raindrops. A crab scuttles into a tidal pool. Raindrops. To me, the way I see it, it's kind of humorous. The crab is escaping rain by going into a tidal pool. Mm -hmm. So that, that's... Uh... And then another one, for instance, beach sunset. A hermit crab's shell game. Beach sunset, a hermit crab's shell game. Now, senryu uh, believers would probably call that a senryu because it's got humor in it. Yet, uh, because it involves, you know, it's not serious enough. To my eyes, it's uh, it's a haiku because it describes something real happening. The Senbu uh, people who think that it's a separate form would say, well, there's too much intrusion by the author calling it a shell game. 
that's the dilemma we we face or I face anyway. I was going going to to start in now and ask you more questions about that, but I think it possibly might be easier if we go through the sections and the way you've segmented haiku and what you're saying will possibly become clearer. What do you think? Oh, sounds sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I want to make it clearer. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we're always going to uh, agree on this, but we can disagree happily and kindly and end, end friends. I hope we, it remains to be seen. But anyway, uh, <laughs> sh- <laughs> shall we, it's shall an we awfully get... small issue to get <laughs> worked up about too much. Oh, yeah, but I mean... Friendship. I believe in the past, probably before you and I were even thinking about haiku, that um, and certainly in, in Japanese circles, they used to get very exercised about all these things. And again, that's something that exercises me too. I was just reading, now what is it called? Let's see. Um, a, I think it's called, I've got it next to me, Modern Japanese Haiku, an anthology by Makoto Ueda. And he speaks a, a lot about the the schools of um, haiku through the ages and how certainly post Shiki's death that uh, there were certain factions. I mean, I think there have always been factions in, in haiku and the haiku de- development and how they used to get terribly exercised between the conservative side of things and the more radical experimental side of things. And I don't think that's that's ever going to change really. I would love to see, after we put this podcast out, what people who are listening to us will have to say about your thoughts, about your your definitions of, of haiku. And I'd love to see that discussion really take off because I don't I don't honestly think that we think enough about our haiku, how we write it, and what it means almost to the outside world. And maybe again, we'll we'll talk about this as, as we go through. Let's start, George, with the section haiku about nature, which you say is the section that has got nothing to do with us, nothing about us in it. Apart from the fact that uh, there's a human being that's written these pieces, and <laughs> that's always in the background, of course. Yes, and- but um, it's... Do you find this bit a little bit less egotistical? You're you're very much in the background in haiku about nature, as the poet. Oh, definitely, that is yeah. definitely true. There's very little intrusion of the self. Okay, so uh, I've got two here. Okay. To read. Autumn linden, a school of leaves, still swims, the current of air. Autumn linden. A school of leaves still swims the current of air. Full moon. Cave mouth speaking in bats. Full moon. Cave mouth speaking in bats. And from your smile, I can see you find that humorous as well. (laughs) No, it just takes me back to a holiday. Um, I do find it. I do find it humorous, uh, the idea. Well, I'm going to come on to that in a minute, but it takes me back to a holiday that I took in Cambodia. Uh, so I'm sitting on a, most people call it a mountain, but because I'm from from around these parts, it's more like a hill to me. I'm sitting on a hill. I've clambered up with lots of other people and the sun is going down. And the next thing you know, into this dusk, fly out a humongous amount of bats. I mean, just they went on forever and ever and just makes me smile to to think of that. The other thing that makes me smile is, are we going to fall out about a little, little something that I call anthropomorphism and the cave mouth speaking? I'm not overly keen. I think I've already said this to you that I'm not overly keen on anthropomorphism, the sort of personification of the cave mouth. But I think in this instance, it's not a problem because, you know, we talk about cave mouths all the time. And if you're going to talk about a cave mouth, why then wouldn't you talk about a cave mouth speaking? But I just wanted to question you, that aside, do you feel there's a place for anthropomorphism in haiku? How do you feel about it? Well, yes, I do, because it's uh, 
it's a, another way to be more original, uh, okay. to find a context where you have, um, you, where you can add an another level of meaning, mm -hmm. and that makes it a richer experience for the reader. Take, for example, the word current. Mm -hmm. Use that to describe air and water. And so, in this case, I've combined uh, the fact that uh, there's a current of air and the leaves flutter like uh, uh, the fins of fish. Mm -hmm. And right away, you can see that there's uh, there's some sort of connection there. Yeah, it's a it's a more unusual way of looking at it, which is what every poet strives for. Yeah. So if you can find contexts uh, that sort of uh, fit two different uh, streams of thought, mm -hmm. uh, then you're you, you're in luck. Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that one. I'm not gonna argue against that one. Now the other thing. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think seasons are important or do you just think it's our relationship nature that's important? Well, I think uh, they're both important. Uh, mm -hmm. But the trouble with seasons is that the, the haiku um, has become such a popular uh, form of poetry that uh, you have people all over the world writing it. So you have mm -hmm. people who are north of the equator, south of the equator, east and west, far from each other, mm -hmm. all with different seasons. And everyone's publishing in everyone else's journals. Mm. So uh, it, it would create unnecessary uh, confusion, or uh, to use the Kigo word. It, it, that's my opinion anyway. So I don't bother with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other words that you've chosen for the haiku uh, should be good enough. Okay. I think I think I would slightly disagree with you there. I, I still think that wherever you are in the world, it's not just our relationship with, with nature. It's how nature changes. And whilst not everybody has season, and so maybe a seasonal word is the, the wrong way to look at it, everybody can see those changes and those fluctuations in their natural environment. So oh, that's if, I totally agree with you. I thought, I'm not mm -hmm. against uh, mm -hmm. key, uh, season words. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think that they're not always necessary. There mm -hmm. are some hard and fast rules that are put forth by some people who say mm -hmm. you must always have a key go. Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't agree with that. That's okay. all I'm really saying. That's all. Okay. I'm not taking a hard and fast uh, stance on not using it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it's it's very interesting. In in the olden days, you, they would have been talking about different schools of of haiku and uh, how one school would find something very important, and another school would would say, no, 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 that's less important, and you should be doing this, that, and the other. And I wonder, do we have that these days? First of all, I want to say that I'm delighted you quoted Makato Ueda's uh, book. It's mm -hmm. sort of in my Bible. <laughs> Got me going in haiku. All right, okay. I love it. By the way, it's a, a superb piece of writing. Fantastic. I um, I was sent the book to review uh, oh. because I was working for a periodical at that time in the mid seventies. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I read it, I thought, oh, "This is fantastic," because my poetry prior to that was uh, longer form, but very imagistic. Mm -hmm. I thought, why am I writing using all these words that don't seem necessary when I could be writing stuff like this? And that's what got me going. Uh -huh. now, now that you mentioned uh, the book, uh, mentioned the book, my thoughts got roiling, and I thought, well, wait a minute. There are schools of Japanese uh, thought uh, about haiku that don't uh, are against the use of kigo. Absolutely, <laughs> I find that in the book too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, think it's just, I just think it's a healthy environment to have these disputations uh, to uh, discuss and uh, we'll never totally ever agree but mm -hmm. that's part of the way things go they have it in physics they have it in every field of inquiry and knowledge mm -hmm. and it's just healthy and I think what's happening in uh, North America mm -hmm. uh, is that these schools of thought are emerging. 
there are organizations like the Haiku Society of America that try to keep things sort of have a very broad perspective, schools mm -hmm. like that, like uh, organizations like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are so many splinter groups within that organization. And I think they're going to emerge with their own uh, larger bodies of organization that uh, are going to become argumentative. And a lot of, a lot of great articles are going to be written and a lot of discussion will ensue and that'll that's all good for the haiku because i think right now there's not enough uh true criticism going on and uh the other problem is that you have so many people who are practitioners of the form who are also critics and their self-interest gets in the way often in their analyses of things so if 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 things continue this way, there are going to be people who are just who love being critics and who don't feel the need to write the poetry themselves, but they love the analysis, the historical perspectives, and and bring enlightenment to our understanding of the form. Yeah, it's that's such an interesting point you've made because I was thinking a lot about that in the last couple of months wondering do we still do we have people who are writing and analyzing haiku critically who can move discussions forward and i, I wasn't too sure that we did so maybe i'm wrong no we need people like makato ueda mm -hmm. the uh people someone who is writing about english language haiku mm -hmm. and doesn't himself Right, haiku. Yeah, that would be fantastic, really. Yeah, but how many? I mean, uh, Ueda was working within an academic department, or is working within an academic department when he's writing. Um, is it Columbia? I'm just trying to think. Oh, it's Stanford. Cool. Okay. Stanford. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I've been searching and searching for department. Uh, academic departments that are looking at haiku in a critical way and i'm really not finding them but that again is true. That yeah is true. yes um, well i'm hoping that'll change you know it's, it's inevitable i think because of the enormous popularity of the form and uh, the early there was an early resistance to the haiku as a sort of frivolous enterprise mm -hmm something that was taught to grade school children, mm -hmm. not as poetry so much, but as a way of counting syllables. Yep. And so that's what most people remember. I remember, oh, haiku, that's right, it's 17 syllables. And, you know, it's just a little fun game you play. And they never saw it as uh, as being a true poetry, which it ultimately is. So once we get through that barrier more successfully, uh, things will change, I think. And there are already movements afoot. For example, Randy Brooks at Millican University uh, has been teaching about the haiku form. And while he doesn't fit my definition of a true critic, he's mm -hmm. trying. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's one step forward. And uh, once uh, creative writing departments, like in the great schools that have them, like uh, Iowa State and mm -hmm. um, other places, once they start putting haiku in the curriculum, that'll be a door and a foot in the door, and things will evolve. But here's another question for you: It's one thing to put haiku in in the curriculum, but if we cannot agree what a haiku is about, how do you teach it? Well, <laughs> how do you, you know? We yeah. But, you, not but someone who's going to teach it obviously has some views and will present them. Mm -hmm. And the students who are attending the, the classes will uh, accept them or not. And there'll be discussions, and which is all healthy and good. Mm. Um, and there is something there, obviously. Both of us feel it. You must feel it, too. Otherwise, you wouldn't have uh, launched your enormously successful uh, website you know i'm just a mind boggled by it it's mm. incredible i do feel it 
I feel, but I and I feel it very strongly. And I feel that if we don't get serious about our haiku, then we will forever be seen as people who are just sort of dabbling in poetry. Because if we don't, if we, no, that's not fair. What I'm trying to say is if we cannot communicate to the outside world what haiku, English language haiku is about, then we may find ourselves not being taken seriously long term. I think as long I think there's a there's a strength in the interest in haiku. Mm -hmm. Because it's such a it's a it's a easy diversion to get mm -hmm. immersed in the moment and yourself and the search for something meaningful. In a world that is so full of information and misinformation, it's it's just uh, overwhelming sometimes uh, that I find, especially, especially with my aging brain. And uh, so uh, when I sit down next to a window and look outside and I see leaves and sunlight, and I think oh, I sort of sink into a haiku mode of just experiencing. And then I think, well, also, maybe I should write about something. What comes to me? Well, maybe nothing comes, but I'm just enjoying the moment mm -hmm. and I'm ready for something that is sort of intense and short and sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that'll never go away, that yearning that we have. Yeah. So you're at it already. You're getting my brain ticking over. <laughs> <So> <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, now, Let's go on, shall we? And uh, we're going to do the section haiku about us, which we briefly spoke about before. But perhaps we should start with hearing a couple of poems from that section and then we can go on. And I'm I'm sorry, but there are going to be more questions, George. Well, I'm, I welcome them. They're fun. <laughs> OK, my first uh, one about haiku about us. Singles Night. The loud chatter of loneliness. Singles night. The loud chatter of loneliness. Free will or not, the desert highway narrows to a dot. Free will or not, the desert highway narrows to a dot. So that last one, brings up another point about haiku, and that is rhyme. Mm -hmm. the, the form is so short that rhyme can overwhelm it and become the entire focus, missing the moment. And it probably does miss the moment because the rhyme just is just too much about the person's own uh, way of thinking and using words. But in this case, not and dot hardly overwhelm the poem. And I think they they remain uh, a useful part of it. We spoke briefly before about Senryu or haiku about us, as you have it, not being Im imagistic, but that one, that one is very, for me, quite an imagistic poem, I, I feel. And the previous one, the, the singles night, the loud chatter of loneliness, that really hits me in the gut. You, you said, as we were discussing the last poems, that you want to write something that looks at, looks at an occurrence in an unusual way. And I, I felt that particular poem really achieved that. Singles Night, The Loud Chatter of Loneliness, by using the contrast. I thought that was superb. I wanted to ask you about this. My worry with Senryu or Haiku About Us is that we have got lazy possibly over the years and we're not as well educated about what the differences are. And so the two forms merge and it does nothing for either side to merge them. I, I sometimes feel that I'm being very lazy when I don't distinguish haiku and senryu and somewhat disrespectful, but I just wondered if you had any direction you could point me in. Uh, how are you? How do you think about it? 
Well, if I understand what you're saying correctly, mm -hmm. um, I have no problems with it. I, I simply deal with uh, haiku about nature and us, mm -hmm. combine them, and that's it. You know, um, and in a, in a way that still um, adheres to the central idea of what a haiku is. Mm -hmm. And uh, haiku about nature and us are so rich with possibilities because they're taking two different sets of uh, possible images and uh, multiplying by two the number of possible combinations you can have of juxtapositions. So um, no wonder it's the most popular <laughs> form because it, 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 there's so much you can deal with. Uh, if you're writing about nature only, you're restricted to this one context, which can be extremely gratifying. Mm -hmm. And the sense of egolessness can be a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, thing. And uh, same with uh, the Senryu, you know, Deal Senryu can really hit the mark as well. But when you can combine the uh, possible sets of images from both into one form, my gosh, the imagination goes becomes twice as fertile. No, I agree with you. But I think the point I was trying to make is that many journals, and I'm guilty of this myself, we don't split haiku from senryu we don't make that definition and my my worry is that we've just become either lazy or uneducated about what the differences are so i was interested when you actually put senryu into the haiku trinity and made it part of the haiku family as opposed to a, a separate entity in and of itself. I So I guess my question would be, do you see a difference between haiku and senryu? What would that difference be if you do? Or do you, do you see them as so related that there is very little difference between them? Well, there, the differences that I uh, expound, well, I don't dwell on that too much, but just simply uh, relate in the book, um, are are real. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what, what the question you're getting at is the blurring that's yeah. occurring. And yeah. that's that's a confusing. Well, people don't realize that there is a, a difference, and they should realize it. Uh, and when they and, and you're saying that probably um, uh, editors should make a distinction. Um, so it's it's really a very strange circumstance that you've identified, and I can see why you think it's troubling. Um, but that's why a book like mine was written. <laughs> to to <laughs> hey, look at this. I mean, this is the way things are happening or can be viewed. And uh, that would could be enlightening. Um, then again, you have a journal like uh, Failed Haiku, mm -hmm. like Relling, who founded it. And he, I think, founded it because he was taking a poke at the negativity towards the senior form. It's inferior. So he called his magazine Failed Haiku, and it's been enormously successful as a proponent of the senyu form, or in terms of my language, haiku about us. Um, so there, there are all these healthy reactions that mm -hmm. are happening, but you're right, it's, it's, it's a problem. And I believe uh, Frog Pond used to separate them, uh, they used to have separate sections, and I'm not sure about modern haiku, whether it did or not. I, I suspect it also did. But the anthology, the major anthologies, such as Corbenden Heuvel's anthology, and Jim Casian's anthology on, on English language haiku, mm -hmm. highly respected uh, publishers, mm -hmm. don't, uh, in the actual uh, 
text that they that they print uh, for each uh, contributor make a distinction. Mm. Cor Bendenhoevel does in his um, afterward points out uh, which are great sendry, which are great haiku, and g- provides definitions for them. So it's it's a it, I don't think I have an answer for how to solve this problem, <laughs> and it's, it's going to continue. Yes, my best, my be- I put my best effort forward with uh, the collection, the way a poem emerges. Uh, now you touched upon the um, next part of your book, which is haiku about nature and us, which, as you've just said, give you more possibilities for juxtaposition, and I suppose give you a greater opportunity to develop your work as well. You've got much, much more to write about, haven't you? You said that it's become the most popular of your trinity in terms of of the amount being published. Why do you think that is? Well, just uh, pretty well uh, what I said earlier, just it's easier. Mm -hmm. You've got more possibilities for combining elements for the poem. It's the best of all worlds. You're looking Mm -hmm. at nature and you're looking at uh, human, human foibles or human activity and human artifacts. And that's probably the most complete view we can have of our world is is combining both, um, and it's just it's just there. You sit down and you start thinking. I, I got I got a writer's block. Oh wait a minute, let me try. Uh, you know, combining haiku about nature and us. <laughs> you probably get out of it. Um, shall we hear some of your nature and us poems? Certainly. Yes. My first one is uh, Suicide Bridge. A row of raindrops clings to the railing. Suicide Bridge. A row of raindrops clings to the railing. The next one. Logged hillside. Velodromes of time on each stump. Logged hillside, velodromes of time on each stump. Thank you. Before we go on, I wondered, how do you feel about the current trend to put a sort of a thought and an image together? Many people have taken the haiku and instead of putting two images together, like you've got your logged hillside, and yes, velodromes of time on each stump. But somebody might have put, for example, velodromes of time on each stump. I know I love you or something. You know, do you know? Do you know what I mean? That the, the, there is there is a point. current yeah, there's the current trend to to have that one image, and then have a thought rather than an image as the juxtapos- juxtaposed bit. Yeah, basically. Uh telling the reader more than you should be. Mm-hmm. The words, the images, and the juxtapositions you've used should remain a bit of a puzzle. And you never, ever really know completely what that haiku means. Mm-hmm. If you're adding a, a, a thought, you're sort of guiding the reader in a direction that uh, narrows the imaginative interpretation of the poem. Yeah. Well, I'm not for it. <laughs> yeah, that's two of us. <laughs> uh, now, George, uh, you say in your book as an introduction to section one, which was haiku about nature, that for many readers and writers, haiku is uh, about nature is the ideal because the ego of the writer is absent or more or less absent and frees the reader to better experience a sense of wonder. And I Totally agree with you, and we've spoken about that. But despite my predilection for haiku about nature because of its lack of ego, I'm going to ask you to finish today's podcast with two more poems from haiku about nature and us, if you wouldn't mind. Over to you, because you know which ones I'm going to ask you to read. Yes, I do. (laughs) The first one. (laughs) Fallen tree. The lutinous. It's moss. Her mons. Fallen tree, the lutinous, its moss. 
per month. The next one, full moon, nowhere to piss. Full moon, nowhere to piss. The last one, full moon, we talked about this, about the <laughs> haiku being quite amusing. And this one just made me um, fall about laughing. I just absolutely loved it. And the first one, I found the first one, fallen tree. Just on my first reading through the book, I think I I emailed you and said, I absolutely love this, but I haven't read the whole book yet. But I came back to it time and time again. It's just the language in it is is so wonderful. It's unusual. So you have the, uh, the volutinous. It's such an unusual word to find in, in a haiku. And then you have the alliteration. You've got the, the moss and the mons and, and all the S sounds in it. Lutinous, moss, mons, just rhythmically and listening to the poem. It's just, the sound of it is just wonderful. The image of it is superb. To me, very almost Japanese garden like, uh, if, if you like. You know what you've just done? What? What have I done? Make me see that poem with new eyes. Uh, <laughs> I think, hey, it's way better than I thought. <laughs> it's fantastic. You, it, it's it's it is. I mean, I love them all, but that one, that one to me is. You know, I'd take that one to my grave. That is a fantastic piece of work. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased I've given you something new to to see in it, but it's so so sensual. But with both of them, what? interested me and again maybe because i was seeing the first one in the way i did i wondered how do you go about writing like that could be because you know we spoke off off camera about my education and what i didn't tell you was i was edu educated by the nuns so i would have real problem even today writing that first poem or the, either of those poems actually because they've sort of first one is too sensuous and the second one's got a rude word in it so how do you um how do you go about sort of this unabashed unfettered writing process well i have to credit my background um i managed to grow up during the uh, up the beginnings of the hippie time hippie uh, madness so, so to speak and uh, bachelor in the 60s and 70s in, in a place, Toronto, where a lot of stuff was going on and a lot of clubs and drug use and so on. Uh, so that helped shaped, shape my perspective on things. It made it very unlike that of nuns and priests. And I must say this as, a, as an aside, I did, I did go myself, although I'm not a Catholic, to a Catholic boarding school for two years. Oh. So I have a sense. And then also, I think the thing that set me off on this path, more than any single other event, was the fact that I ended up, uh, after getting my master's, I ended up going to Indiana University, where a friend of mine, where we were both undergraduates at UBC, this friend had been there for a year longer and gotten involved with uh, getting tablets of pure LSD. So he was my guide through my first uh, LSD experience and he made it extremely pleasant. And um, I remember going through the entire night on, on a hillside in the middle of Bloomington, Indiana, just feeling wonderful. And at the end, as I was, uh, the, the effects were we wearing off, my wife, my first wife and his first wife came with a bacon and lettuce t uh, sandwich for me. And it was the most delicious sandwich I've ever had in my life. <laughs> anyway, it got me thinking about things very differently, obviously. Mm -hmm. I've had much better sandwiches than the BLTC. <laughs> it still put my mind on a different track on, you know, so that was that was good. Now, George, you've taken us through the Haiku Trinity. But your book does have a further section, which is also fascinating. It's called Beyond, in which you ask the question, 
When does a haiku become a short poem? And when does a short poem become a haiku? And I've got my own thoughts on that, but I'd love you to come back and read to us from that part of your book, The Way a Poem Emerges, A Haiku Trinity and Beyond. And perhaps we can have a discussion about that. Will you come back? That would be wonderful. I, I love it. <laughs> I look forward to it already. But before we head off and have a cup of tea, tell us, where can people buy your book, The Way a Poem Emerges, A Haiku Trinity and Beyond? Well, the easiest way is just to go to Amazon.com. That's it's there. Wonderful. Well, I'll put a link in the show notes and everyone can go there. And I, I have to say people should go and buy it, read it, think about what you have to say, and then come back and email us both and, and tell us what you're thinking. I'd really love to see discussions take place, critical discussions take place on this topic. So, George, thank you so much once again for coming to see us today, and we'll see you again soon. It was delightful, and thank you. My thanks to George for his reading, for the work he's done for the English language haiku community, and for this book, which, as I said earlier, nicely kicks off our discussion on the haiku form. Do come back for part two next week, when we think about the differences between haiku and short poems. Don't forget to email us to let us know your thoughts on haiku definitions and how George's thoughts align with yours. I really would like to make this a discussion this year. So thank you all for coming along to listen to us. I hope you enjoyed the chat as much as I did. There's more next week. Don't forget to check the submissions diary on the website and our new membership schemes. The link to that and the resources we discussed, as well as George's book, all in the show notes. See you back next week for part two, which will also be audio and video. Until then, keep writing. And don't forget, if there's something missing from the show notes, just email me. Ciao.